right, so I'm going to start Discover. As I was saying, today we're going to spend the day discussing um, different visualization techniques. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to run any optimizations. I'm just going to start something um, from what we went over last week and just show you a bunch of ways that we can um, visualize that data. OK. Um, so the first thing we need to do is get Discover running. And um, if we've already run some optimizations, we don't need to run anything here. Uh, we can actually just take one of these folders. Uh, so I'm going to look at the bridge constraint example we went over last week. And just copy and paste the name of that folder. That's your job name. And paste it into this text box and go to load data. So you can sort of ignore uh, the job specification panel on the left. Just look at the visualization thing here and it should load in all your axes the right way. Okay, so the first thing we'll look at is how to make a simple scatter plot. And a lot of that's already done for you here in the um, Explorer interface. Uh, but it's usually helpful to have a still image that shows some of your data analysis. So basically showing the, the depth of the exploration of the forms. Uh, using the scatter plot, but also tying it to, to the images of the designs. Typically, what I like to do is pick one good scatter plot image. So I'll just sort of use this interface to zoom in to my data. Uh, you see here that by using the middle mouse uh, wheel, I can isolate the zooming and panning uh, to the x and y axes if I just scroll in the main area, or to each individual axis by actually just hovering over those axes and scrolling over them. So you get pretty good kind of control over the way you want to visualize um, these points. And then I want to make sure that I also have the right mapping to the axes. In this case, we're looking at a two objective problem. So uh, it will default to showing you your last two entries. <laughs> on the X and Y axis, and they're ordered by um, first the ID generation and then all the objectives. So if you have two objective problems, by default, you'll get this objective versus objective plot, which is typically helpful for showing that parade up front. If you have two objectives, usually that front is, is very clear. Everything's going well. Um, and then also, the size and color will default to ID and generation. So by default, the color will show you time, uh, which is really useful for looking at your optimization while it's running. Because the main thing you want to understand while the optimization is running is, uh, number one, are you seeing better and better designs? And number two, is that kind of, can you identify a trend uh, over time that's finding better and better designs? So as we're running these things and kind of refreshing this view, we want to see new red designs popping up sort of on the prayer front or shifting the prayer front more and more. So that's the default view again, often, uh, this is um, what I'll export for, for a kind of data analysis image. And if we have a single objective, it'll default to time generations being on the x-axis. Um, so that's useful as well. If you have a single objective, you're not really looking at trade-offs. You're just looking at that performance over time. So then both color and the x-axis represents that time of optimization. So once we have a good view, right now there's no options for exporting this as an image. Um, but we can use my favorite software that comes built in with Windows, is the snipping tool. Uh, so the snipping tool will allow you just to take screenshots of your, of your screen. And what I like to do to make sure everything is always lining up is instead of doing like a rectangle snip, I'll just go to new and do a full screen snip. Oh, just give me my entire screen, and I can later crop it um, in, in my graphics software. But it at least maintains the relative position of everything. So if I want to take multiple screenshots, uh, which I will do, everything will line up. OK, so I've just captured the whole screen. I'm just going to go to Copy and open up Illustrator. The first thing we'll do is comp compose a quick scatter plot image uh, in, in Illustrator. Wait for this to load up. Right. 
And we're going to be going back and forth between a lot of different software. So if you have any questions um, as I go, just feel free to interrupt me. Okay, I'm going to set up a new document. Um, I'll just make like a letter uh, landscape. And I'm just paste that image into here, into my document. I never, I uh, usually don't like bother with saving these screenshots. I'll just uh, copy them to the clipboard and paste them directly uh, into the software I'm working with. Um, so you'll see the outlines of that page there. And I'm just going to do this really quick for now. Um, sort of position that. And then. Oh, interesting. Some kind of weird full screen mode here. Hmm. Not essentials. That's the problem. Yeah. Um, so once I have this image, now I can go to mask up here and mask out the parts I don't want. And it's important to use mask and not um, crop. Because mask will just apply a clipping mask to it and maintain the dimensions of the original image, whereas crop will actually crop the image. You see if I kind of hover over it, you see the bounds of that original image. And that's going to allow us to line things up better. Okay, so I'm just going to position this sort of loosely in my canvas. And now I have my basic scatter plot. The next thing I want to do is maybe go back here and go to isolate optimal so I can actually show something about the optimal designs or the Pareto set uh, in, my, in my graphic. So I could just hit isolate optimal, go back to my clipping tool or snipping tool, um, and now do full screen snip again, copy to um, my clipboard, or at this point I might actually save it because it will make actually lining things up a little bit easier as we'll see. So I'm just gonna cap save this capture my clipboard. And now back in Illustrator, I could copy and paste it back in here, but then I'd have to rescale it and crop it the same way. Instead, what's really easy is I'll just take this image and go to my layers. Where are we? Yes, there we are. Um, and then I'll duplicate the layer that this image is on. So set by dragging it into this new layer button, hide the original, and now I just have a kind of duplicate of this image on a new layer. And now I can select A for the direct selection tool, select the image, and here I see the information about my image. In this case, because I pasted it in, it's an embedded image. But using this interface, we can actually replace that image very quickly with our new one. I have the same exact dimensions to do full screen snip and it should pop that new image directly on top of it. So I'll go up here to Embedded, go to Relink, and then on my desktop, find my new image, and go to Place, and should directly put it on top. Let's take a look. So there's my new one, and there's my original. And now I can use some of Illustrator's overlaying tools. Um, for example, you know, if I don't like the, the opacity that you can discover here, I can actually drop the opacity of this overlay layer. Um, I have to go to the transparency. And here I can either drop the transparency, so I can actually control the amount of fading out of the, the whole data, or I can go to here the overlay modes. And for example, do a, a multiply, that will Composite the new information directly on top of it, so you won't see any difference. But for other things, uh, these different modes may be useful. Okay, in my case, I'll just use this to kind of vary the transparency of the data behind. Okay, and I can do this again. For example, if I now want to show uh, a couple designs uh, specifically with screenshots, I might first browse them in the Explorer and just start clicking on designs that I find interesting or representative that I want to show. So maybe I'll um, look at the first design here, the lightest one, the heaviest one. Oops, should move my view a little bit. Um, 
and then a few in between. Now I can take the screenshot again here, or you know, I can go into Illustrator and add any other graphics I might want. You know, if I want to change the stroke outline or something like that, if the designs are selected, I can do that there. Uh, in my case, I'm just going to take a quick screenshot. Save that. And just do the whole process again. And maybe I don't need both. I'm just going to select my top image and go to relink there. And these are dynamically linked um, for now, unless you want to embed them again. Um, so if you update that image by exporting a new screenshot, it should actually automatically update as well. No option. OK, so I have my basic uh, scatter plot composition. I'm just going to lock these layers, make a new layer on top, and now I'll start to bring in my screenshots. Um, so it's really easy to find the original screenshot for each of these images. If you go to the folder of your project, they're all going to be in images and actually numbered uh, according to the design ID. So if we start with our first image we selected, it's 2533. We we'll quickly find that uh, in this folder. I'm just going to scroll to it. So just go ahead and find that image, and then we can click on it and drag it into our Illustrator file on our new layer. And you can start to style this however you want. Um, typically, I'll just so we'll put them to the side. We we'll start creating this composition. Um, and usually I'll add like a piece of text just to say like what the design ID is. Maybe it's not so important depending on the audience, but if you want to remember um, where these designs came from, it's helpful to kind of annotate. You can always retrieve that design later. Uh, so I believe this one is 2533. So place that there, and then Control G, group that together, and now we can uh, create several copies. Uh, so what I did there is um, I selected it, clicked and dragged while holding uh, Alt and Shift, create a copy, and then Control D several times to continue that copy. Okay, and now we can go through and basically link all the rest of our images. And we can use the same workflow we used before instead of going back to our directory and pulling the images in and rescaling them. We already have everything laid out here. So I'm just going to use this um, technique uh, by selecting the direct selection tool. So this lets me go into the groups without ungrouping it. Direct select the image, go up here, relink. And now I have to find, um, again, my project folder, my images. But now I can actually just directly type the, the name of the image uh, or the name of the uh, uh, design ID. So the next one was 2500. And you'll see it'll pop up here. Click on it and go to place. And those will pop in. Right, and then we'll go through and do it for the rest of them. Uh, 2505, 2463. So it's a little bit of manual work, but using Illustrator, you can sort of automate certain parts of it. And it sounds like fun. There we are. Um, and of course, you want to tag where they are in the scatter plot as well. And you can either do that through uh, copying the design IDs. Uh, that can be a little bit cleaner. So this one, there's this one. Uh, 
or you can start to draw vectors or lines or something like that to show that uh, where they are. All right. And the last point I'll make that's very important is labeling your axes. We want to remember um, what these numbers mean and how we're visualizing these designs. Um, so the axes are labeled here, right? You can include this in the image, but sometimes it's a little bit too cluttered. So most of the times I'll just draw the labels manually. And then we're looking at here, the space on the X, weight on the Y. So I'll just drop that in. So that is our basic scatter plot. Any questions? Pretty straightforward, but like I said, I've been making these kind of things for the last few years, so I figured I'd just give you guys a few tips so you're not reinventing the wheel for things that just kind of work really well and work pretty fast. Also, the things I showed here are sort of my minimum expectations for the final for the graphic to produce. You can think of it as uh, built into the parts. So you can, of course, think of other images and types of visualizations that show more of your specific idea. This is sort of main requirements that I think apply to uh, whatever the project is. Okay, um, so that's our scatter plot. Next, let's get into some animations because the whole idea of generative design is that we're exploring lots and lots of design options. Um, so sometimes it's enough to show just one or a couple of designs, but a lot of times to show you know, the idea of this workflow, it helps also show, you know, the, the depth of the exploration, the number of designs that were explored, and also show a little bit about, like, the, uh, the behavior of the algorithm itself, how it's able to sort of get better and better over time or explore that design space. Uh, so the most basic kind of animation we can make um, is a GIF, an animated GIF. So let's show that workflow really quickly. For that, we're going to need to get into Photoshop. And for this, um, I'm actually just going to pick out a subset of images that I want to show in my animated GIF. So I'm going to make a new layer called Selection. And then here I can go in and, and browse my designs. I probably want to select the designs more meaningfully, but I'm just going to for now, get a bunch of random ones as a sample. Now, for, a, for an animated GIF, you can have as many frames as possible, but when you see the image or if you want to like post it on Instagram or Tumblr or whatever, each of those images are going to have to be loaded up by the web server. So these things can go pretty big in size, and it all depends on how many images you show. It doesn't matter how long animation is, it's actually how many individual frames there are in the animation. So you want to uh, keep this under control. I, I've done GIFs like if I'm not publishing on the web, it's up to like 100 frames, but the workflow gets really bogged down in Photoshop, as you'll see. So this kind of animation is usually a bit to limit it to just a, you know, a, day, a dozen or so uh, frames. So I'm just going to copy it. See these design options and put them in a separate folder. You'll see why that's useful in a second. Okay, so let's go into Photoshop. And um, what I will do is go to File. Before I open any document, I'm actually going to use one of these included um, scripts in Photoshop. I'm going to go to File, Scripts, Load Files into Stack. And what that does is it lets you select. A series of images and it will automate the process of creating a single document with each of those images as a separate layer. So that's exactly what we want in our case. So um, once this pops up, go to browse and now we're going to go to our project folder. This is why it's really useful. Put them in a separate folder because now we can just go to our folder, control A, select all of them. Click OK. So it's going to load up all your images here. And then click OK. And it's going to make the document. You can see this is a part of the workflow that use any more than 100 images. 
becomes really, really slow because all of this stuff has to be loaded into Photoshop as layers. It takes like a huge amount of RAM. Um, so try it and you can actually test, test your computer with this. Try as many as it doesn't crash. Um, okay, so this will take a minute. It's actually like loading them in and compositing them. So that's a little one by one. Uh, but once it's done, see not done yet. that they're all coming in as different layers. And Photoshop's been nice enough to actually label them with a design ID, which is great. Um, and so here we are. And then uh, the process of making the animation is more or less automated as well. Once we have everything on different layers, I'll go to Window um, Timeline. So these are the little known about animation features of Photoshop. Not super useful in general, but really nice for making GIFs. Um, here, I'll keep it as, um, or I'll switch it to create frame animation. If it defaults to video timeline, go to create frame animation, and then click the button to create your animation. And it's going to give you, by default, one frame with whatever layers are visible at the time. And then we can click this button on the top right corner and go to make frames from layers. And it's actually just going to give us one frame for each layer we have in our document. And if it matters to you the order, I believe it comes in reverse. We can go to the same uh, button here and go to reverse frames. In our case, it doesn't really matter for any designs. Um, in some cases, it would. OK, and if you click on these frames, if you've never done this before, basically, a frame is just a state of layers. Right, so in this frame, it's just this one layer is turned on and all the rest are turned off. And that's what that um, uh, option did for us. You know, from here, you can go and change these on your own. You can think of these as almost like uh, captured views or something like that of your, um, I shouldn't have done that actually. Looks like whatever you change is gonna affect all the rest of them. So I'm just gonna go back here, delete that and run that process again. Layers. And then reverse frames. OK. So we have each of our frames visualizing a different layer. And by default, it's set to 0 seconds, which means that animation is going to run as fast as it possibly can. It's going to depend on you know, where you're viewing it from. Um, but we can preview it by hitting the Play button. It's going to happen very fast. And you know, if you're on a faster computer, it will be faster. If you are doing a film online, it will probably be slower. And usually, we want to control that a bit. So I'll select all the layers. Um, and I can actually set the delay between each frame by myself. And that can actually be different for each frame. But I just want a continuous animation. So I'll just do like a half a second between each one. Make sure down here that you have forever. Checked. You can actually control the number of loops, uh, but typically GIFs we want them to animate forever. And now we can do that. Okay, and um, depending on what you're doing, you can change these independently. So maybe we want to animate the first few pretty quickly and then take a pause on the last one if that's your best design or something. And once we have the animation the way we want it, just go to File, Export, Save for Web. And this will bring up our uh, GIF optimization window. You can set a lot of things here to basically compress the size of that file for posting online. You want it to be as, as small as possible. So there's a lot of different options for like limiting the color palette, um, different kinds of optimizations for how to compress that file. And this is really useful because a lot of times for these generative images, we just want the idea of something. It's not like a beautiful design. It's usually a screenshot. I mean, I mean it's a beautiful design probably, but it's not a beautiful image that you're like crafted in Photoshop. It's just a screenshot of playing grasshopper, right? So a lot of times we can do a lot to compress these by like, you know, if there's really not much difference here between having 32 colors and eight colors, but it's really going to drive down the size of your file. 
And here you can see the final size and how long they laid on a 56k modem, which is still the benchmark for some reason. Um, that's a really long time to load an 80 kilobyte file. Um, but when we're happy with this, and you can preview it here as well, and just make sure this is still set on forever. This is more or less what your image will look like. Once you're happy with it, go to save. Just save it out on my desktop. It should be GIF by default, images only. So save it out. And find it on our desktop. And we can play it there. Or usually for GIFs, we can also load it into, um, into an internet browser. It should help. All right, so that's a GIF. Um, next, let's look at some further animation things for actually creating videos. So to make videos, we're going to look at After Effects. You see we're kind of dabbling in all these different Adobe products because they're all really specialized for different things. So we made you know, Illustrator, it's really good for vector graphics, for composing uh, diagrams or data visualizations. So we did that with Scatterplot. Photoshop is useful for a lot of things. In our case, we're just going to use it for making GIFs. And then After Effects lets us get into the actual uh, animation and making videos. Okay, so here we are in After Effects. Um, and to get started, we want to load some assets. We want to load uh, some video data. And in our case, the video data is going to be just a series of our screenshots. So if you ever worked on rendering animation workflows before, uh, you know that typically when we make animations, for example, like in 3D Studio Max or Maya, we're not outputting a video directly from the software. We're actually outputting a series of rendered, rendered frames at something like 30 frames per second. And then we load them into After Effects as a stack of images, where each image is loaded as a frame into the video. We're going to do the same exact workflow here. Even though our frames don't represent a movie, they represent a series of designs, we can still work with, uh, with animating them that way. OK, so uh, in my project browser, I'll right click and go to Import File. And I'll go to my project folder and images and just click the first one. And because they're named sequentially, lucky again, um, After Effects will pick that up and by default will allow you to make a, a sequence of images depending on whatever file some changes. I think also two are going to be PNGs. So we're going to make a PNG sequence, uh, make sure it's checked and import as footage. Import, you see here, it's just brought in a stack of images and it has frames from zero to 2,549. That's all of the designs we generated. And now we can just drag and drop that into our composition and make a new composition down here. And if we hit play, you'll see it's just a crazy jittering free fall. Now this is, could be interesting depending on how much trend you're seeing in your data. You should expect something like it's really crazy in the beginning and sort of settles down over time. But this is not necessarily the case. And it's not the only indication of the successful optimization. Depending on the trade-off between your objectives, you might never see like a full convergence where it like starts to look like something specific at the end. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. So sometimes these are useful, but more often than, than not, um, it's just too much too fast. It's not like it doesn't give you the sort of analysis of what's actually going on. Uh, nevertheless, we can start to work with this a bit. Um, you can see here it will create a clip in a certain time period, and this maps onto whatever your composition settings are, but the default is 30 frames per second. Right? So if we have 2,550 frames, you divide that by 30, and then you'll see how fast your animation will be. But we're not necessarily limited to that. For example, we can click on the clip here in our composition and go to time, and there's a bunch of time settings we can use. So for example, time stretch, very basic. We can just stretch that composition to a percentage of our current one. 
So 25%, the clip will be uh, four times faster. And in this case, it's, it's just not rendering every frame. It's rendering every four frame, whatever it needs to do to hit that 30 frames per second uh, mark over the duration of the clip. And if we want to get a little bit more, um, if we want to have a little bit more control over the time, we can actually, Um, control the time directly. So if I right click on the clip again, go to time, enable time remapping, it's going to give me keyframe control over the exact time uh, of frames visible in the time of the bar, uh, of the uh, animation bar. So by default, the time remap control starts at zero when I'm in frame zero. When I go to the end of the animation, you see it's at the the end of the clip. But I can start to control this timing just by using these sliders. So for example, if I drag the end of the clip all the way over here, right, it's gonna interpolate that time between. So this is the exact same thing as just shrinking the, the period of the clip. It's gonna go four times faster. And then after this, it's just gonna be stuck on that last frame, right? Because we have this is the beginning of the clip, this is the end, and this will just be sort of the end stretched out. And if we want to control that even more, we can actually go here into our graph editors. So if you click this button, whatever clip you have selected or whatever sort of keyframe animation, it's going to give you the full, um, so we have to select that thing we're animating. Uh, it's going to give you a graph basically of that uh, interpolation, right? So we have frame zero here our last frame here, and it's interpolating linearly. It's just sort of scaling that animation down. But with this graph editor, we can get a lot more control. So for example, an animation I really like to do um, is the sort of slot machine animation, where things roll by like really, really fast in the beginning and slowly settle down. And if you create uh, to like a final sort of solution, if you cur curate your frames really, um, Specifically, you can get this kind of effect that the algorithm is sort of settling down on something or um, uh, coming up with a solution over time. So that's actually pretty easy to do with this graph editor. And we can just think about how we want that interpolation to go. And you know, if we think it through, we sort of want it to begin at the beginning, right? And then we want it to ramp up very fast to sort of go through the animation really fast at the beginning and sort of slow down and ease up over time. And we can actually start to control that easing in and out by changing these keyframes to a uh, smooth Bezier curve. So I'm just gonna select both of those keyframes and hit this button here to create a Bezier curve. Now I can drag this out and create the timing I want. So I have this kind of smooth curve that starts very fast and becomes more slow over time. And this tangent here is going to set the rate at the end of my clip. So let's take a look at how that works. So it's very fast in the beginning. And let me actually even like scale this way down. So let's say I'm targeting like a 15 second clip. I want to make sure that my last frame is right at 15 seconds. I'm just holding shift and straighten it to that horizontal so I don't lose my, um, my last frame. All right, so this will be a 15 second animation. Starts very fast. It's, at this point, it's skipping a lot of frames. But at some point, it's gonna sort of slow down and become more gradual. You can control that even more by dragging this out and really getting that curve how you want it. And probably also move over this composition end time to my 15 seconds. Make sense? Cool. You can do a lot with these time time mappings. All right, and the last thing I'll show you in After Effects is um, 
just one time effect. So if you go, if you right click on the composition, let's get out of our graph editor. Here's our clip. If you right click on the clip, go to effect, there's a bunch of time effects. Let's look at one called time warp. The time warp is gonna introduce some effects to create transitions within your animation. So, so far we've looked at each frame as kind of a still in our animation, um, but this will allow us to create kind of transitional effects. And there's two basic settings. There's pixel motion, which is by default, and then there's frame mix. Let's take a look at both. Um, let's just play that. Okay, so you see the effect happening, and right now it's going pretty slow because it's actually processing that effect through the frames. You see the green bar, it's caching that uh, video into my RAM, so the next time it should play at real time and you can see the effect a little bit more. So this is Adobe's uh, kind of interesting uh, pixel motion effect. You can see it in a lot of the filters and effects that they have in After Effects. Um, and what it tries to do is that it actually tries to move the pixels between different frames. So if you have a continuous shot, like you recorded something, maybe at a slow frame rate on your camera, it can start to fill in those frames intuitively. Uh, it's a cool effect, and sometimes with this generative design stuff, it works kind of well, and sometimes uh, not so much. I would say this case, probably not so much. Maybe at the end a little bit, when things settle down, we can see a lot of these weird fragments. So for this, I'd suggest like give it a try. I've used it before, but it's a fine line like with all effects, and it starts to become kind of weird and cheesy. And you know, presenting this to clients, like, you don't want it to call attention to itself on its own. Be like, uh, but if it gives you the effect you want, then it could be useful. Uh, in general, though, I typically will switch this to frame mix, and frame mix will just uh, crossfade the layers between each other. It's a lot more intuitive. Um, in this case, you might not see the effect so much, but almost all the time there's more than one design there. So I, I find like just applying this effect to the video will give you a little bit more of a smooth uh, video. It's not so choppy and kind of jittery. Right. Um, okay, so let's say I'm happy with this animation. Uh, the last step is to export it as a video file, and that's really straightforward in the latest versions of After Effects. You just go to Composition, Add to Media Encoder Queue. So I really recommend if you're using the old uh, render queue to switch over to the Media Encoder. It'll launch a separate program. Um, the media encoder, it keeps all of the codecs really up to date, it has the latest um, compression algorithms. The default settings in media encoder will give you the best video. It will be an MP4 file, which is standard. Uh, it's going to have really good compression, give you a small file size with no loss, uh, no visible loss of quality. Um, so here's the encoder. And the other nice thing about it is because it's a separate program, it will load all of your model, all of your composition into here and then you can still work in After Effects uh, while it's rendering out. Okay, so um, you can change the location of the file. I'm just gonna keep this default in the temporary folder and then click Run. Just default settings. Um, this, I, this is all I ever use. I've never found a reason to like dig into the different encoding settings, as opposed to the traditional render queue where we always had all these kind of uh, settings we have to do to make sure the video isn't too big. It does it by itself. Now I'll show you a little preview. And once that's done, you can just click on the file here. I'll take you to the folder and you can watch the video in your video player. Okay. So we looked at scatter plots, diagrams, and illustrator. We looked at animated GIFs using single frames in Photoshop. And now we've looked at making MP4 videos in After Effects. So really quick, three different software, but just really the basic techniques uh, for these kind of workflows. The last thing I'll show you is a custom, um, a little small piece of software I wrote to actually create specific images for this workflow, which composite different images together. So the main limitation with these kind of images is you're looking at one design at a time. And 
that might tell you a little bit about the process, but as you know, when we look at genetic algorithms, it's actually computing like one generation at a time. It's considering a set of designs at once, and each particular design or where it happens within that generation is relatively not so important. So a type of image we used to make a lot manually is to actually take several designs within a generation and start to overlay them together in Photoshop and create images for each generation so we can see sort of how the generation in total uh, evolves. And what I've done is create a little program to automate that process. Um, and you can find that program on my GitHub. Let's go here. So it's the same place uh, you can find Discover. And here, if you go to repositories, um, I have a repository called Process Images. It's a very simple little program. It's just a Python script. Here you can see some of the documentation of the options that are available uh, for you. I've just recently updated this to Python 3. So um, there's two ways to use this program. You can either download the Python file directly and run it from Python. And in this case, you need to make sure you have these installed. So Python 3, sure, you have if you're running uh, Discover without Docker. Uh, NumPy, you'll have to install to a numerical um, math library for Python and using it to process the images. And then the Python image library called Pillow. And I think this is actually included with Python 3 now, so you might need to install it separately. So that's one version. Um, but if you don't want to go through running it in Python or installing the dependencies, I've also created a standalone like, .exe program that you can run and you just download it here uh, from Dropbox. Um, for that, I use like this packaging software that packages Python and everything together. So it's just a really big file. It's like 250 megabytes for a small program. Um, so if you can get it running in Python, it's a little bit uh, better, I think, or you can just use it here. Um, so we'll see the program in a second, but basically what it does, you can see an example here, this is uh, optimization run over 16 generations. And what we're doing is actually compositing each of the screenshots from a single generation on top of each other so we can get a composite image for each generation. And if we lay them out in this matrix, we can sort of see the optimization happening over time, right? Matching our intuition at the start. First generation will always be completely um, completely random, so you'll see a lot of noise, and then by the end, you see the kind of convergence. Again, this isn't specifically the case in every generative design model. Sometimes you won't get that convergence, but if you're having a single objective problem, for example, this should always be the case. So if you're just optimizing for a single value, you should see that convergence over the generation. In this case, our two objectives are playing together to get this one optimal shape, so it also makes sense. Okay, so let's quickly launch that program to see what it looks like. Um, I'm gonna use the same, um, the same optimization run that we used earlier, the bridge constraint. And I'll go to where I have this program downloaded. So here's the Python file, and I have the exe here that I'll just run. Um, it'll take a second to load up. Let's load Python in all of those libraries. There's some kind of conflict here. This discover server. Oh, yeah, it just takes a little. If you run it natively from Python, it should load up immediately. It's just this packaging thing that makes a little slow. Okay, so you get this little interface um, with the options for how you want to make your images. First thing you need to do is set the directory, and this will be your image directory. All right, so here's our project bridge constraint. We just want to select the directory of all of our images from, uh, from the optimization. We'll go to select folder. And now in overlay modes, you have three options. And these are the same as the overlay modes in Photoshop. We have transparency, which will just create a crossfade effect. They'll tend to create kind of lighter uh, images. 
um, because it'll actually change the transparency of each individual frame. And then you have multiply and darken, which will actually start to overlay the images that composite them onto each other, which will tend to create darker images, darker, darken being the darkest one. So like you can think of it that way. And we'll we'll do a couple examples here so you can see the difference. Um, but this really depends on the quality of your screenshots. Uh, to get this to work well, I suggest you make your screenshots screenshots on a white background as much as possible and reduce any um, reduce any visuals that don't have something to do with your design. Right. So make sure you zoom right on the model and um, have a have that white background. Transparency will probably work the best in cases where there's not a white background because we'll multiply it and start closing the backgrounds and get really dark really fast. Um, so let's just keep on transparency for now as a default. The main thing you're going to want to look at is this here, designs per generation. Because the images folder is just a flat collection of all the designs. You need to actually tell the program like how many designs were in each generation so it can break up the images properly. Uh, in this case, I had 50 designs per generation. And these two values allow you to skip over designs. If you have like a really big optimization run, it can change how many designs you're visualizing within each generation. So if you have 50 designs in a generation, but you don't want to composite all 50, you can just say like use every second design. So it's going to take 25 designs per generation. Just skip every other one basically. And then uh, here you can set how many generations you want to see. If you have 50 generations in this case, I might not want to generate 50 images. Maybe I just want to generate 25 images. So I'm just going to go and skip every other generation as well. Uh, make index will make a, a single image that indexes or shows all the images together. So the index is basically this image here. Um, so this program will make a single image for each generation and then also optionally have this checked make an index file, and here you can set the aspect, the width over the height uh, for that image. So 2.0 will give you like a landscape image, just like this. You set that less than one, like 0.5 will give you a portrait image. Okay, um, so once we're happy with this, I'll just hit run. And um, everything works, it's going to create a new folder in the images folder we specified. So we selected the images folder in our bridge constraint optimization. And here it creates a new folder called composites. And I'll start to create those composite images for you. So here you see the transparency setting. It's basically taking each one of those images and giving it an opacity like relative to the number of images. So we have, if we have 25 images uh, rolled up here, each one is going to have an opacity of like 1 over 25. And once it's done, it's going to make that index file for you. Um, it's going to be a really high res file. If you zoom in, you'll see it's also numbered the generation. Let's take a look at the other modes. Go to multiply. And here's where the blend factor comes into play. That's actually going to create, um, as it layers the images over, it's going to use the multiply setting, composite them together, but also give them a little bit of transparency so it's not so dark. If you want the complete multiply setting for all the images, you can set this to 1.0, but usually it's a little too dark. So we'll keep this at 0.8 for now. And then I'll run this again. And we'll just see the files being overridden here. Okay, see them popping in. You see it's a kind of darker image because we're not completely cross-fading them together. We're fading them a little bit, but also overlaying them on top of each other using that multiply uh, blend factor. And this will go a little bit slower than the transparency as well. So it really depends on your screenshots. You, know, you want the screenshots always to be as clear as possible. Um, so when you do these blends, you're not just creating a, a huge mess, right? You want some situation where if there is a convergence, then you also see those images kind of converging onto a, a kind of single strategy.
Okay. So once we have these images, we can go back and use our other animation tools as well, right? So now instead of creating a GIF or a video of single screenshots, we can actually start to animate um, these composite images as well. And that tends to work really well. And usually it will give you a little bit more information than um, just looking at individual images at a time. Right? So if you want to animate these, here we can go to import file. And now we have the folder composites. Um, now, in this case, if you didn't render every generation, these numbers are actually going to skip a little bit. They're not going to be continuous. So in this case, you actually have to force After Effects to interpret them as an animation. And then go to PNG sequence and force alphabetical order. So if your frames are not numbered sequentially, you need to go, you need to tell it to force the order. The import. It should be a much shorter animation now because we only have a few dozen frames. Uh, but we can use our, our different um, animation tools or time uh, tools to actually stretch that video out. And one last tip I'll give you is if you have an animation uh, where there's not that many frames, but you want to stretch it out and actually create that kind of transitions between each frame, you can use the um, you can use the time warp effect, but first you can actually rescale the whole image so that you get more time in between the different frames. So I'll just show you what I mean really quickly. I'm gonna delete this clip from the composition. And then here where I have my composites image stack, I'll go to uh, right click on that, go to interpret footage and main. And here's where we control how the footage is brought in. We can control like the default frames per second, and things like that. But down here, you have other options. We have a, ch a choice of looping the animation, right? So instead of playing it through once when we load it into the, com into the composition, we can loop it 10 times. So just click on that, I'll just select 10, and now we'll load it into our animation, you see what's happening here is it's actually just gonna loop through it 10 times, right? That's not really what we want, but, and this is just like a trick I kind of learned uh, over time, when we apply this time warp effect, we can select the speed here. The default is 50, and what it's doing is actually playing the clip at half the speed, and every other frame, it's putting in a transition. That's basically how time runs. Uh, time warp works. So if we have our frame mix at 50%, it's saying, okay, I'm gonna play the first frame, I'm gonna play another frame, but in between, I'm gonna have one frame that's a mix of the two. And if you have more frames in between, by bringing down the speed, you have more interpolation. So you're gonna create a smoother transition. But when it does that, it's going to actually kind of step through your animation. So if you say, okay, I want five frames between each for a transition, by the time it gets to the next frame, it's gonna already be at the fifth frame. It's not gonna visualize all of your frames. So the hack to that is actually first, make the composition longer by interpreting the footage and looping it a certain number of times, and then reduce the speed in the time warp. And those are relative to each other. So if in this case, I want the speed to be 10, that's gonna be 10% the speed. I wanna loop that clip 10 times, right? If I want the speed to be 50%, I'll loop the clip twice. It's, they're inversely proportional uh, to each other. I'm gonna set the speed to 10, and I have frame mix turned on, and now if I play this, it should give me the effect of basically playing the clip 10 times slower, but showing me every frame, and then creating 10 frames of, um, of interpolating footage in between. So it's gonna play like three frames per second. So let's take a look. So that's to render it through a little bit. Oh, <laughs> I wanted to uh, get rid of that index before I render. Because when I, um, or put it into a different folder. 
Because when I said force alphabetical, it's going to actually bring in every single frame, no matter what it's called. So I'll just um, reload that footage. A little bit shorter. You can see now with a combination of these tools, right? We have the compositing tool, which creates kind of overlay images of all of our designs in the generation, plus the time warp, which creates this interpolation between our frames. We can really start to create this more intentional animation where we're seeing the things sort of evolve over time um, through the process of optimization instead of just seeing kind of a wild array of different designs. Any questions?